Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody today? What a beautiful, bright, and sunny Such day it is outside. And cold. Awesome. And cold. And cold, yes. <laughs> um, you know, it has to be that kind of time of year where we could just kind of change the seasons a little bit. Hopefully not really abrupt like what's coming next week. But So what did that intro video remind you guys of? I was standing there watching it, and I was kind of going, oh. Reminded me of the old Etch-A-Sketch. So that was like an electronic <laughs> Etch-A-Sketch. Yeah. You know, the absolute frustration box where you're dialing up the knobs, trying to make something other than squigglies all over the page. And, you know, if you really spend a lot of time, like, you know, one or two years, you could actually come up with a good image on that Etch-A-Sketch. So that was kind of cool watching that thing go on there. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So in this tiding, in this season that we're in right now, in, in this whole season, this holiday time in here, you know, we, we've had a lot of, of people passing during this time. And especially this last week, we have, we have three and then a couple of classmates from out of state passed away this week and it was just like it just keeps coming and coming and coming and it, and it kind of makes us lose that joy it makes us lose our focus on the reason for the season and we have to go back and we have to think about hope and love and joy and peace but see that's what we're here to do today is, is to bring us back into God's presence, into worship, to be able to focus on those things that are important. So we are in week four of Advent, <clears throat> and it is the fourth week of our Advent conspiracy. And so today we're going to have a message that talks about loving all. And we've already learned what it meant to worship fully and to spend less and to give more. And so this week, Pastor Terry is going to tell us all about loving all. And so I'm looking really forward to, to that. Coming up, we got a busy schedule of stuff coming up in here. So Christmas Eve candlelight service is going to be at 11 p.m. Uh, as a reminder, we will not be having Christmas Day services in here in the morning. Uh, that will be our Christmas service for there. 11 p.m. right here. Um, should be a really, really cool time. So um, I always love candlelight services. They, they just are really meaningful for me. Our next men's breakfast is going to be here already on January 7th at 9. Uh, so we invite you all to come in there. Um, we're looking at some very menu items again in here. Always plenty of food. So if you go away hungry, it's your own fault. And we've got devotions already set up and ready to go. And a great way to kick off the new year. And from what I heard, I heard some rumblings that we're going to have our women's group starting up hopefully soon. And uh, so that we get to make those announcements as well. January is going to be a busy month. We're going to have our movie, our next movie, God's Not Dead, We the People. Um, we're going to tie down the date, hopefully on Tuesday of this week. And so we'll be making that announcement in there. So this is going to be the fourth installment of the God's Not Dead series of movies. And it should be a great time. Every one of those movies always has a pretty good, um, pretty good message in it. And possibly not be a tearjerker at the same time, but uh, we'll have to see. And then coming up in February, starting on the 11th, we start season 18 already of Orange Track Racing. And so uh, looking forward to that. Uh, talked to several people that have little kids and they were going, oh, we didn't know about that. So we're gonna have to uh, get their attention out here and get some more racers going, but uh, season 18 kicks off February 11th. So well, let's bow our heads and uh, uh, as we come into our time of worship this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for the sunshine, for bringing us out of that darkness and bringing us back into the light. Lord, you reveal your world to us through the light. 
And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for that. We thank you for this season. And we thank you for the anticipation of the birth of your son and of his second coming. So Lord, we just ask that you would keep us in the spirit of the season. Keep us in your presence as we start our worship today. We praise you and thank you for these opportunities to gather together here in your name. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So our call to worship that Pastor Terry has chosen for today comes from 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And this is from the New Living Translation. And it says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for his sakes, for our sakes, he became poor, so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. So when we think about this, we're, we're thinking about God's generous grace. God brought his son by grace, gave his son to us. God's grace, our, act, our power to act like God, comes from that grace. God grants us that opportunity to join with him in his presence, in his spirit. And it's unearned and it's undeserved love, but he gives it through grace to us anyway. God gives us that love through his son, Jesus. And so when we think about this, in this instance, God's grace developed a spirit of generosity is what uh, we're talking about here in the Corinthians. And so his grace surrounded the people in the Macedonian churches, which is who Corinthians is, is written to. And we need to have that same grace and generosity that God brought into their presence. And see, we need to do that to help people in need. And that's called sacrificial giving. And Christian giving is a means to grace. It's a means of giving that power of God's love back as we work into his presence, as we do his work in our lives. And Paul described the nature of the Christian stewardship. He described the example of the Macedonians and, and encouraged the Corinthians in their stewardship. And a lot of people think, well, stewardship means we're going to pass up a basket around here and everybody gives an offering. But stewardship means that we are doing God's work. We're giving back. We're good keepers of the gifts and grace that God has given us. And so we're able to pass that on others. And that's what stewardship is about. A lot of churches get it all confused. We're going to have a stewardship Sunday. That means everybody has to open their pocketbooks. But see, stewardship is to do well with the gifts that God has given us by his grace. And giving to others in need is an act of love. And so this week of Advent, we're turn, we are to turn our hearts towards love, God's love for us, and our love towards others. That's what this fourth week of Advent is all about. So as we do that, and as we hear Pastor Terry's message today about loving all, I want you to keep that in mind, that we are to be good stewards of God's grace, which is given to us by love, and we're supposed to pass that on to others as well. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, today for this day and the message you have given us to love all. Pastor Terry is going to bring his message of hope and peace and joy and love to us today as we prepare for the coming of Jesus. Lord God, we adore you because you have come to us in the past with the birth of your son Jesus. You have spoken to us in the book of your word. And Lord, you have challenged us in the words of the prophets. You have shown us in Jesus what you are really like. Lord God, we adore you because you still come to us now. You come to us here today, and you are in our very presence. You come to us through other people and their love and concern for us, and you come to us through men and women who need our help. You come to us as we worship you with your people and as your people. Lord God, we adore you because 
you will come to us at the end. You will be with us at the hour of death, and you will still reign supreme when all human institutions fail. You will still be God when our history has run its course. We welcome you, the God who comes. Come to us now in the power of Jesus in this day and in this hour of worship. Come to us, Emmanuel. So today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and as we come forth here to uh, light the Advent candles in here, I'll give my lovely wife the opportunity to read <laughs> and speak. Okay. Is that on? That is. Okay. All right. Today is the fourth Sunday in the season of Advent. In anticipation of the coming Christ, each week we light another candle of our Advent wreath. This morning, we light the fourth candle, and we wish for the world to know the promise fulfilled in our King, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, and we say, many are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us, too many to declare, and that's from Psalm 40, verse 5. As we reflect on the wonders of the promise of Christmas, we give thanks that all of God's promises to us are fulfilled in the birth, life, and death of Jesus. And we rejoice in God's faithful love, which brings us immeasurable joy. Today we celebrate that joy is ours, the joy that is ours, in the promised Christ, God with us. Amen. with that comes our scripture from Matthew 1, 18 through 23. And I want, as you hear this, as you listen to this, as you read it on the screen, or if you've got your Bibles and you're reading it in your Bible, pay attention to the order in which this happens. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The angel appeared to whom first? Mary. And then to Joseph. You remember back a few weeks to another sermon Mary chose and Joseph obeyed it's about love and I always find it interesting as we get ready to do a, a message and, and certainly this morning's message is about loving all and I've just been inundated all week with stories of love. Um, one that sticks in my mind is this, there's this young baseball player and he was at bat and the ball came, left the pitcher's hand and something happened and it hit the batter in the head. And he, it knocked his helmet off, he went down to the ground he stood up, shook it off, and went to first base. And what happened next, the 
world sees it as sportsmanship, I see it as pure love. This young man took off his batter's helmet, threw it on the ground, and walked over to the pitcher's mound because the pitcher was just crying. Now, major leagues, college, what would we expect? Brawl. <laughs> this young man went over and he hugged the pitcher and told him he was okay. That's a true story. This young man actually received an award, and I can't remember, the, I can't even pronounce the guy's last name. I think it's Pujols, I think is who awarded it, or who was there with him, but the pitcher spoke and handed the award to him. These two guys live in different communities. They were battling for a spot to get to the Little League World Series. And now they're friends. This story I read this morning as I was drinking my morning coffee and just enjoying some time alone with God. So this is, it, it sounds first person, this is not my story, it's someone else's. But it says, I was at the grocery store this morning and heard a log crash and something shattering. Being nosy, I walked towards the sound and saw some people whispering and looking back to the end of the aisle. When I walked down the that aisle, I saw an older lady had hit a shelf containing dishes with her cart, and many had fallen to the ground and broke. She was kneeling on the floor, embarrassed, frantically picking up the shattered pieces while her husband... I don't know about this guy. But her husband was sitting there picking the uh, UPC symbols off of the dishes. And he said, now we will have to pay for all this. Okay, dude. The writer continues, says, I felt sorry for her, and everyone was standing around and staring at her. And it doesn't say this in here, but i got to imagine if it's anything like today, they all had their phones out. Mm -hmm. Getting ready to post that up on social media. But the writer had gotten down on their hands and knees and was helping. And then the manager showed up. What happened then? Well, we would expect the manager to say, we got to have to pay for it. No, the manager got down on his hands and knees and started helping to clean up and said, stop. I need you to just take care of yourself. Please go to the hospital and get your hand bandaged. It's been cut. But what about these dishes? She was concerned about the dishes. And he said, ma'am, don't worry about that. That's what we have insurance for. It's not going to cost you anything. The writer goes on to say this, wherever you are, close your eyes and imagine God doing the same for you. This is about God's love. Collect the pieces of your broken heart from all the blows life has thrown at you, God will heal all your wounds, and I assure you that your sins and mistakes will be forgiven. You see, we all have the same insurance, and it's called grace. Unlike the insurance we have for this world, it doesn't cost us anything other than accepting that free gift. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness, the manager of the universe, God, will say to you, everything has already been paid for. Now go on your way. All is forgiven. That is a great summary of the message today. But I'm, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to keep going. <coughs> Max Lucado says this. He says, Jesus went from commanding angels to sleeping in the straw. Why? Because that's what love is does. It puts the loved before itself. Your place in heaven was more important to him than his place in heaven. So he gave up his so you could have yours. This whole series, and this is, this is kind of what Mark and I have been preaching since our first service, and in January we will be starting our 
but it's always been about foundations. It's always been about getting back to the basics. It's always been about understanding why. And this series has really helped us understand why we celebrate Christmas. But the principles that we have been talking about, Mark mentioned them earlier, worshiping fully, spending less, giving more, and loving all. They're not just for Christmas. They're for every day of the year. That first week when we talked about worshiping fully, we talked about how we all worship something. And throughout the year, Mark and I will encourage you to worship. Jesus. And to worship fully is about giving Jesus all of our attention, our focus, and our worship. In week two, Mark encouraged us to spend less. And then in week three, he encouraged us to give more. Two very, those just did not go together well until we heard the message that God had given. And that all leads us to today and what it means to, as Jesus did, love all. Now, for some, that may be quite a tall order because it brings on a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different feelings, and it can actually put a lot of anxiety in your life. But let's put your mind at ease this morning. It is usually the simple, common sense acts of love that make the difference. Common sense acts of love. Maybe, maybe you decided to have pizza for dinner and you sat down on the couch to watch a movie and you get up to go do something and your spouse or whoever's sitting right next to you and you just, as you get up, you grab their plate and take it up to the kitchen. It doesn't seem like much, but it's actually an act of love. It's those little things that you do for one another that bring you together. So to what end would you go to love someone? That's on the real easy end. To what end would you go love someone. I remember back to when the girls were born. In fact, in 1983, just before Amanda was born, she was born two years after that, Cabbage Patch Kids became, were the hot deal. Y'all, and some of you are old enough to remember this, the fights in the stores mm -hmm. over those cardboard box dolls. They weren't even that cute. Well, I guess they grew on you. But at the time, I didn't even think they were that cute. And then by the time Rosa and Carissa were born, it was all about the beanie babies. I was fortunate I didn't get caught up in any of that mess. But unfortunately, a Walmart associate back in 96 did. He held up a Tickle Me Elmo. And... Fortunately, he only suffered minor, uh, well, not minor, I wouldn't say minor. He suffered a concussion and a broken rib. As hundreds of shoppers stampeded him for that Tickle Me Elmo. Now, this is definitely our consumeristic society going to extremes to please their children whom they say they love so much. I've got to ask, is that really love? Is stampeding and hurting and fighting over a toy an example of love to show your child? I don't think so. Is it any wonder that we've lost our perspective as a society on what Christmas is? by the very wording of today's sermon, we're going to be challenged to 
to love all regardless. And it's easy to say, just like anything else, it's easy to say, it's not so easy to do. To love all is a call to action. It's real love. Now, some may need a reminder of what real love is, and we're going to talk about that. If most of us are familiar with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But it's worded differently when John writes in 1 John 4, 9 and 10. He says it this way, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Here's the, here's the part. Verse 10 says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. So real love, it, it, it explains why God creates. It is because he loves, therefore he created us to love. It's also God, why God cares. Because he loves people, that he cares for all people. Not just, you know, not just this one, that one, and that one, everyone. And it's why God gave us free will. We are free to choose because God wants a loving response from us. It also explains why Christ died. It's God's created solution for our sin because God loves us that much. And it explains why we receive eternal life. Because God's love for us is eternal. The world has gotten so far from God that it no longer understands what this real love is. How many of you heard this phrase tossed around just willy-nilly? I like that term, willy-nilly. <laughs> I love you. Love you! It's tossed around and it's become watered down. And that's why the world is so confused about what love is. Love has been reduced to a feeling, and I'm going to say a, a word in church. Hopefully they don't get censored by the social media powers that be. But love has been reduced to a feeling, and it is most often associated with lust. that has nothing to do with love. We just got done going, talking about the different points of what real love is. And did you notice that none of those were about a feeling? They were all about an action. If we look at love as a feeling, Think about feelings. Where are they at? All over the board. How easy is it for you to change the way you feel? What out there can instantly is like, ah, it changes so quickly. It's just another reason why it's so important for us to get back to the basics and back to the Bible. Jesus is the embodiment of God's love, and he demonstrated that throughout his life and his atoning sacrifice on the cross. Now in Luke 4, Luke had just finished telling of Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And starting at verse 14, Luke recounts Jesus returning to Galilee and how he was filled with the Holy Spirit and that he was teaching in the synagogues and the people were praising him. That is, until he got to Nazareth, his hometown. This is where Jesus would go to the synagogue. He would open up the scroll, and he would read from Isaiah. And he read this, uh, as recorded by Luke in 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. 
Now, there is many uh, theologians that have gone back and forth on what that was meant by Isaiah. I see it as Isaiah foreshadowing the coming of the Messiah. And then Jesus proclaims this prophecy as fulfilled in verse 21 when he says, The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus had come to set us free. And what happened after that? The very people in his hometown rejected him. Isn't this the son of Joseph the carpenter? And, and Mary is his mom. We all know them. He's not the son of God. He can't be the fulfillment of that prophecy. And hindsight's twenty twenty. so I'm sitting there going, how on earth can they possibly reject God's generous grace? Kind of the same way we do. The same th way that we reject things. In our call to worship this morning, uh, we heard Pastor Mark read from 2 Corinthians about generous grace. Let me read that one more time. It says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Jesus was in heaven with the Father, commanding the angels, and he chooses to be poor. He's born in and laid in a manger. And we've talked about this before on Christmas and on Christmas Eve and other times during Advent. That manger was out with the livestock. It was like they a room in the house where the livestock stayed, but it was just a like a stone cut out with hay in it. Now, I grew up with farm family, so I remember jumping around in the hay. And it's not real soft, especially when one piece decides to poke you. But he was laid in a manger. I read something else this week that, that not even in here, so I apologize to Mark and Diane. The baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, we talked about the shepherds previously, and how the angel came to them and told them that Jesus would be found in swaddling clothes. That's the same thing they would do with the first unblemished. They would wrap the, that first lamb like that to keep it from being blemished. So it's almost, it's a, a foreshadowing of Jesus being our, the sacrifice for us. And what happens when he is laid to rest in the tomb? He's wrapped in strips of cloth again. Just something to think about that has got me scrolled so far away from. But it's about his love for us. He came, he died, and rose so that we could have eternity. And going back to him having been rich and making himself poor, he was rich in ways that the world doesn't understand. The world understands that as winning the lottery or getting a six-figure income or all these other things, but that's not what it was. And Jesus came to bring that good news. And it says good news to the poor. Not poor when you like opening up your wallet and not having anything in it. Poor in spirit. We don't, didn't have that redemption. I think back to the passage from Luke 2, uh, from the first week of this series, where we heard this in verses 10 and 11. It says, Don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. That's a good long sentence, but the one piece that stands out is that it's for all, not just a select few. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. God loved us that much that he gave us his son. Probably 
problem is, is people have fallen into a trap. They think that there is no way, and the world has set this upon them, that there is no way that God, the creator of the universe, could possibly love them because of all the things that they have done. Many people struggle with the fact that Jeffrey Dahmer came to know Jesus before he was killed in prison. That's kind of an extreme example, but God loves all of us regardless, and if we come to him, he forgives us of our sins. The world's taught us that we can't be loved because of the things we've done. We've got to break free from that. God is not... If we accept Jesus our Lord and Savior, he's not about punishment. Did the angels tell the shepherds that the good news would bring great joy to just a select few? No. Bring great joy to all people. We have to understand that no matter what we've done, that in God's eyes, we matter. We matter. It's a free gift of God's grace for all of us. And we just have to receive it, unwrap it, and be thankful for it. Once we do that, then God calls us into action because love all is an action. So what's that look like? Well, Jesus tells us that in Matthew 25. I'm not going to read this whole por uh, portion of this passage because uh, there's part for the uh, goats and the lambs, and we're just going to go with the lambs. But Matthew 25, 31 and 40 says this, But when the Son of God may, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now here's the important part. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, and notice how the righteous are Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. This parable is about Jesus teaching us what love and mercy look like. They are things that we can do each and every day. They don't have anything necessarily to do with money or your abilities or how smart you are or how good you look. They are simple acts that are given and received freely. Too many will just walk on by and not give these brothers and sisters in need a second thought beyond let the government handle it. That's what welfare is for. What these people need is a not just a hand up, but a hand up. And that and I said I've been talking about things that Mark and I do all the time. This is what we want to do for the church for the brothers and sisters asking who these brothers and sisters are though is like asking the question in the parable of the Good Samaritan when Jesus is asked who is my neighbor it's not about who but what it's about what we are doing to serve showing love like this Brings glory to God. 
And I think it's also important that it goes even further. It's not just about, again, giving that hand out, but that hand up. Yes, go ahead and feed someone and give them something to drink, but then help them find a job. Teach them how, or as the scriptures say, teach a man how to fish, and he will be fed for a lifetime. A handout has a very high potential of leaving that person in the very same place they are. But when it's followed by the hand up, we're helping to improve their situation. It is in God's grace, mercy, forgiveness, and love that we are all lifted up and out of where we were at. Then we can pay it forward to others by showing them what real love is. As followers of Jesus, we need to distinguish ourselves from the world by showing God's love to all people, including those who have been marginalized and forgotten. Giving of ourselves in this way is an act of true worship. So now we can start seeing how this is all tying together. Worshiping fully, spending less, giving more, and loving all. As the graphic up here says, making Christmas meaningful again. Over and over again in the New Testament, we see Jesus teaching and living out these principles. And as his followers, we are called to do the very same. People are everywhere. They're in our neighborhoods, they're in our schools, they're in our cities and around the world. When we as God's people serve in humble, generous ways, the story of Jesus is told again and again and again. By our actions and by our words, people will see God's love. And any of you that like music, I know you're already going there with thinking. They will know we are Christians by our love, right? They will know. And when people have that kind of love, they will know that God has not forgotten them. They will know his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace, and his love. We need to share this outrageous, radical love of God with everyone. We, I want everyone to experience this. When we do that, then they will experience that same love. Hearts and minds will change. That, that passage from Ezekiel was Ezekiel 36 where he says, take this stony heart and make it a heart of flesh. That's what happens when hearts and minds are changed. It changes the way we live and it changes how we celebrate, especially how we celebrate Christmas. When we show up and love in the name of God, God shows up. As I was preparing, this guy kept showing up everywhere in my research. His name is Bob Goff. He's an author. And he says this, Jesus talked to his friends a lot about how we should identify ourselves. He said it wouldn't be what we said, we believed, or all the good we hoped to do someday. Nope. He said, we would identify ourselves simply by how we loved people. It's tempting to think there is more to it, but there's not. Love isn't something we fall into. Love is someone we become. My prayer for each of you, then, is that you would see God's love in your own lives and that you would share it with those around you. Remember, to love and serve others is our act of worship to God. It's about loving all. Father God, thank you for the, the word that you have given us today, Father. Thank you for this series where we can, again, just continually get back to basics, can, can continually go to the scriptures and learn what it means to truly be a Christian so that when people see us, they hear us, they, they watch us, they know that we belong to you. And Father, I would pray that the hope that they see in us is something that they would want for themselves. 
and that it would inspire them to come to us or that it would open a door or a divine appointment for us to go to them and talk to them about you. Father, right now we have a list, a very large list and a growing list of people that we are praying for to come into a relationship with you. I don't have the names in front of me right now, Father, but you know what those names are. You know the people that we've been praying for. I look forward to the day, Father, when we can take a name off that list because they have come to you. But until that time, Father, continue to grow our list because we want everyone that we know to know you. In Jesus' name. morning as we come in to worship and to our time of communion I want you to think and uh, when we talk about love I want you to think about what love is and we heard from Pastor Terry in the message in here and we heard from the scriptures in here how God describes love and what it means true love there's emotional love and the things that get confused for love. And then there's true love. And if you want to know what true love looks like, it looks like this. It looks like God placing his son on a cross and dying to save us so that we could spend an eternity with God. That is love. That is love be beyond measure. So when we think about love, we need to think about those things that are given freely, openly. God's grace, his mercy, and his love. And see, that ties everything together when we, when we talk about our Advent season. Because when we think about that grace and the mercy and the love, then that brings us hope and joy and peace to our soul. And that's what, it's, that's what it's about. Christmas is the season of love. So today when we hear the words and we take our communion today, I want you to think about that love. It was out of love that Jesus gave of his life. And as they were giving the meal and he was telling the disciples what was to happen, he said, this is my body which is given for you, an act of love. Take and eat. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. This cup is a new covenant. My forgiveness for your sins. And so when we think about that, we, we have to look at that love component. These are acts of love. And it's a reminder of that love that we share in these gifts of communion with each other. The body and the blood of Christ.
morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, it's time for prayers for the people. So if there's anyone that is in need of prayer this morning, I'm be glad to pray for them. I know there's a few that um, I've already got on the list. So. I'd like to lift up the Sanders family and the loss to um, your son Ben this week. Okay. Um, <coughs> come towards Christmas, there always seems to be a lot of sorrow, but um, we praise God for his gift. So um, this morning I'd like to start off by reading a, a Christmas poem and on a Christmas card that I received yesterday, and it's about the meaning of the Christmas wreath, and I, I believe it um, has a message that we can all relate to. So every Christmas wreath is more than just a decoration, it's a special reminder of Jesus the reason for our celebration. The circle of Christmas wreath is a never-ending ring, a reminder of eternal love from our Lord, Savior, and King. The Christmas wreath is a sign of welcome, inviting all to enter in, and reminder of Christ's invitation for all to come to him. The middle of a Christmas wreath is a bare and empty space, a reminder of what life will be without Christ's love and amazing grace. So each time you see a Christmas wreath hanging from a door, may your heart rejoice in the one that Christmas Day is truly for. So we thank you, Jesus, for your love and amazing grace that none of us deserve, but you give freely to those who believe in you and who are called by your name. In John 8, 12, it states, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, Father God, we are seeking you and your light and love and comfort for several people who have lost loved ones this week and have loved ones who are suffering with no escape from pain or illness. Father God, we thank you for the life of Keith Beresford the Sanders family and their son Ben, the Rodemeyer family and their son John. And we thank you for their lives, Lord Jesus. And I know you received them into your home this week, Lord. And we pray for peace and comfort for their wives, their children, their families, their friends, all who shared in their lives, Lord Jesus. We praise and honor you today for all of these people, Keith, Ben, you are a great God, and we thank you for all that you have done in their lives and all that you will do in their families' lives. Give them peace and hope as they go through this time of loss, Lord Jesus. And Father God, we thank you for the lives of the following people who are suffering from health issues. We praise you for Kim and Jen and Steve and Larry and Daryl and Alyssa, Becky and Carla and Don. Whoever else is online and needs healing from a health issue. Father, in your word, you said, we will have troubles on this earth, but to take heart, for you have overcome all things. You are the way, the truth, and the life. For all who believe in you will have everlasting life. Through prayer and petition, we ask for healing for all in need. Let your will be done in their lives. Give them comfort and peace of mind, body, and soul. Let them rest in the power of your word. May the blood of Jesus wash over them and give them healing from their cancer and other issues that are causing their health problems. And Father God, we ask for safe travels for Mark, for my grandson Dylan, and all who are traveling to families and friends this holiday season. We pray you put a hedge of protection around all of us. Keep us all safe on the highways and byways. Keep Dylan and all people traveling by air safe and free from troubles and delays. Keep the pilots alert and give them wisdom and guide the planes to their safe and safely to their destinations. We thank you, Jesus, for what you are, have done and are doing in our lives, Lord Jesus. You are a great God and so worthy to be praised. 
Let us never forget who you are. You are the great physician, the mighty counselor, king of kings, lord of lords, the great I am. You are Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name. Stepped over here, dropped something off yesterday and this morning. Mark and I were talking about a little bit. There's a, a construction trailer for garbage sitting right outside because they're getting the suite next to ours prepared. And at first, it kind of goes to the, the whole thing in the sermon, how you know feelings and things. It's like, darn things sitting there. It's ugly. It's just sitting out there. And as I started to, I was listening to, to Denise's prayer. And God said, think of it as my trailer, and you can dump your stuff in there. You can leave it with God. Mark talks about bringing the, the, your luggage and putting it at the foot of the cross and just leaving it there. Don't go back and get it. You don't need it. Just throw it in the trailer. So now I see that trailer in a whole different light. It's kind of nice that it's in here. It's kind of like that dumpster we had downtown. <laughs> we didn't like that one either. I leave you with <coughs> this. It's, it's Paul's final greeting to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians. And it says this, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again, God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. This is God's love.